what do we know about what kids need to know in becoming good decoders? And keep remembering when we decode, it's not just being able to say the words, it's being able to know what that word means. And what do we know about instruction? Then I'm going to ask about what we know doesn't work. And finally, what we don't know yet. Now, please don't think I can cover everything in this, but I'm going to give you some highlights. So we do know in all of those reports that I showed you, like Becoming an Asian of Readers, Preventing Reading Difficulties, National Reading Panel, all of them say that unless you are proficient with the alphabetic principle, unless you've grasped it and can use it in a large number of words, you're going to have a very hard time reading in English. Now, what I want to point out is we have a very relatively small group of patterns that appear in words consistently. So in that database that I showed you of Ed Fry, you know, almost 80% of the words have these particular patterns. But keep remembering, a lot of them are in multi-Slavic words. And one of the questions I'll also raise at the end is when do we actually start dealing, supporting kids in using their knowledge of the, ortho, uh, of the alphabetic principle in multisyllabic words? That's one of those unanswered questions. I'm gonna just give you, um, that's a, um, what is that? That's a spoiler. So that's one of the things I'll get to at the end. So, we need to have some basis of consistency, exactly when kids begin to generalize and what it takes to help them generalize. We don't have all of that ironed out, but we know that it's absolutely essential to have guidance, to have instruction, to have experience, to have texts that have a degree of consistency. Another aspect is, there needs to be an expectation for variability. You have to, you can't believe that everything, especially if you've been taught the short vowels initially, and those are ones that are highly consistent in the main, you can't expect that everything's going to be a short vowel. I've had the experience during this pandemic doing um, virtual coaching of a child who's near and dear to my heart. And what happened is by the middle of grade one, when this child was, um, you know, when the pandemic came and school shut down, they really hadn't done much beyond the short vowels. And this child's expectation was that everything would have a short vowel. So everything she looked at was a short vowel. Well, it turns out in that passage that I showed you initially from the Dibbles, it's not just short vowels you need to know, and this is a grade level passage. It's also um, the long vowels. You need to know about L and R controlled. So when L follows some vowels and when R consistently follows other, all of the vowels, we have some unique sounds. You also have to be able to deal with some multisyllabic words. Isn't that amazing how many of the words in that passage are multisyllabic? And then look at this. You have to have a modicum of preparation. You have to be ready to deal with words that have unusual sounds. All the ones in red have a vowel pattern that isn't the norm. And you've also got to be ready to deal with some inflected endings. That's a fair amount of knowledge that we're expecting kids to be learning pretty early on. And keep remembering, often we start with the most frequent words. And those of the 100 most frequent words, 29 of them have a variant, an unusual vowel pattern. So sometimes they start expecting that nothing's going to work, right? Well, as well as attending to the letter sound correspondences, we want to bring kids' attention to bigger units. So we also know that teaching kids rhymes can be very supportive. And a rhyme is the vowel and the consonant that follows it. English is not just a phonological language, it's also a morphologically based language. So early on, we also wanna be supporting kids with endings. 
and with compound words. Some of you know about the research that I've done with Amanda Goodwin and Gina Cervetti on the 2,500 morphological families. And what that work tells us is that this group of 2,500 morphological families, actually about half of them, accounts for about almost 100%, actually 97% of the words that first graders read are given in text. That means that when you learn a word like call, there's a whole group of words that you're gonna see. Unfortunately, the ones that you encounter early on, like the, which is the most frequent word in written language, isn't part of a morphological family. But learning about morphemes, learning to extend your knowledge early on is an important aspect of learning to read. And finally, you also have to, as we saw in, just saw in the example passage from a grade level passage on an assessment, you've got to start attending to the middle and ends of words, not just the beginnings, because there are gonna be a lot of long words in the text you see. Okay, so these are some of the things that we know are part of becoming proficient in that alphabetical principle, the decoding hurdle, as it were.